Hello, this is Dennis Pullis. Welcome to another Open Philosophy video. In this video, I will be responding to some of the core mistakes in Wisdom and Nature's video, The Evolutionary Argument Refuted. Just to set the record straight, I'm not a proponent of the evolutionary argument. I think that there are sensible moves that naturalists could make to avoid the conclusion. Unfortunately, Wisdom in Nature 7 is unaware of these sensible moves and has chosen instead to use the tactic of redefine and reject, which naturalists so often do. I do, however, think that there's an important point made by the evolutionary argument, and that is that evolution has no mechanism capable of evolving our ability to veridically know the truth. And it is this point that Wisdom in Nature 7 is wiggling so hard to get out of. Like a worm on a hook, he doesn't know what to do, and so he's fallen back on the old method of redefining. And what he is redefining here is truth. But, as we will see, this leads only to question-begging or impotence, depending on how you interpret his understanding. The core issue is that the mechanism of evolution, natural selection, selects behavior. It selects how organisms act, not what they think. So if we were to consider an encounter with a tiger, as long as you run away from the tiger, evolution will think that that's a good response. Now you could run away from the tiger because you think that tigers are friendly beasts and that they enjoy chasing after people who run away uh, because they see it as a game. This would be a perfectly acceptable set of beliefs as far as evolution is concerned. And so there is no need for you to have a true belief, namely that tigers are dangerous and they're best avoided by running away, in order for evolution to find your behavior acceptable and select you. Thus there is no reason to think that evolution will select only those who have veridical or true beliefs. And this is the problem that Wisdom in Nature 7 is trying to deal with and he deals with it by redefining truth in a manner that I will let him explain. Truth could, for example, be a property of a statement rather than of a belief. If you don't think about this, this sounds perfectly sensible. Statements are true or false. But why are statements true or false? Because they express true or false beliefs or knowledge. If we take away the relationship to beliefs, or to knowledge, then statements are nothing but physical structures. They are squiggles on paper, or illuminated marks on the screen, or sound waves. Physical objects, like marks on paper and sound waves, have no particular intrinsic property of truth or falsity. They simply are ink on paper, or pressure waves in the air, and as such, any relationship that they might have to the truth is completely conventional. That is, that we decide that certain words mean certain things. Absent this intentionality, absent our belief and our desire to express ourselves and our beliefs in sentences, which are statements, statements have no truth. Yet this is the foundation of Wisdom in Nature 7's refutation. Let's let him go on. It could also, as a property of a statement, be something like the secure status of a download after it has been scanned by security software. Thus, we may say that a statement is true if and only if it has been secured as best we can against the various forms of assumption, confusion or invalidity to which our thinking is prone. Like we say that a download is secure when it has been checked as best as it can be for viruses, spyware and so forth. Now let's think about this for a second. What is he defining here? Truth? No. What he's defining here is certitude. When I see an apple and say, here is an apple, I don't go through all of these checks that Wisdom and Nature 7 is suggesting. In fact, all I do is see 
understand, and express myself. Most of us would consider that to be quite sufficient to assure the truth of the statement, here is an apple. On the other hand, Wisdom in Nature 7 is saying that we have to go through all of these security checks. We have to make sure that all possible sources of error have been eliminated. What does that give us? Truth? No, we already had truth directly from our experience. What it gives us is certitude. Certitude is a reflective property that we reach when we understand that the methods we've used to come to our conclusion are adequate to the conclusion. So what he's defining here is not truth, but certitude. Let's go on. Understood in this way, truth would be a conventional property, meaning that the truth of a statement would depend on some assembly or convening of numerous contingent factors, as for example does the price of milk. Furthermore, if truth is a conventional property of this sort, one could admit, as in the second line of the evolutionary argument, that evolution does not select for truth. Just as one may admit that evolution does not select for the price of milk. It is important to note, however, that this does not mean that the convened factors, like the cognitive capacities in the case of the truth of a statement of belief, have not themselves developed by means of evolutionary selection. We can now see why wisdom and nature's response is either question begging or impotence. Wisdom and nature claims to be defending science. On his channel homepage, wisdom and nature says, I speak in defense of the claim that nature, as understood through science, is adequate for wisdom. If he really stands for the scientific method, as he claims, then he needs to understand what that method involves. It involves framing hypotheses and then checking them against the data. Now when we check a hypothesis against the data, the reason we do that is because we know that the data is true. If we did not know that the data was true, checking it against the data would be totally useless. Thus, in order to assure ourselves that we've guarded against all possible sources of error, we need to compare our statement to all of the available data. And we need to assume that in doing so, we understand the truth of the data, that the truth of the data is assured. But this is the very point in question. How can we know that the data is assuredly true? If we assume that it is true, then wisdom in nature's whole refutation crumbles as the house of cards that it obviously is. If we do not assume that our data is true, then he cannot be defending the scientific method as he claims to be doing. Thus, he is either begging the question by assuming that the data is true, or he has come up with an impotent defense which is totally unable to defend science against the restrictive assumptions of naturalism. In short, naturalism, with its total dependence on evolution, is an enemy of science. It is not a friend. It is only by having a philosophy in which we can be assured that our data is in fact true that we can defend and support science. Wisdom in Nature 7 is unable to do this, and so he has failed miserably in his stated goal.